All right, I think this is time for me to hand it over to Duncan, who's going to um, guide us through the rest of this meeting. Thank you so much, Marcy. Um, Marcy, if you want to unspotlight yourself. Um, uh, it is so good to see so many familiar names here, as Marcy was saying, but even better to see names that I'm unfamiliar with. Um, so for anyone who doesn't already know me, my name is Duncan Magidson, as Marcy mentioned, and I am a member of our communications team at Cogenerate, and at 28, I'm the youngest member of our staff. Um, you know, that gives me a special connection to this shift. When I joined the team uh, back in 2017, I was brought on as part of our Gen to Gen campaign. And of course, the mission of that campaign to connect older and younger felt really personal to me, and it has so much resonance uh, with where we are now as Cogenerate. And with that shift, I'm feeling more connected to that goal than ever. And with our push to emphasize cogeneration, I can't help but feel a little bit like I represent the voice of the younger on the cogenerate team, the younger or youngish people in my case, who are really eager to work alongside older people to create the change that we want to see in the world. Um, as you know, yesterday we made that change um, in our own organization, changing to Encore to Cogenerate. And the reason you're here is that you want to be on this journey with us. Um, you are curious or excited about our mission, and we are really excited to give you this opportunity to hear about our plans for the future and answer any questions that you have. So I'm going to spend the next half hour or so asking our co-CEOs, Mark Friedman and Eunice Lynn Nichols, a few questions, um, and then we will turn it over to your questions. Um, so my colleague Marcy is going to be monitoring the chat, um, so please feel free to pepper in questions throughout the time, um, and then we'll have Q&A after the interview. Um, and we're not going to go longer than an hour, so I think I'd better get started. Um, and let me kick things off with a question for Mark. Um, Mark, you have always been a big proponent of the power of language um, to shift culture and make change. And we've really seen that power in the Encore world. Um, and we did a lot of work to put that Encore language out there. So what inspired you to want to use this word, cogenerate, um, a word that comes from the field of energy and power, to talk about this new opportunity to shift the culture? Uh, thanks so much, Duncan. Um, you know, we, um, um, I think, at the most basic level, we wanted to uh, use language that accurately described the work we were doing. That, that, that was the impulse when we changed our name to Encore over a decade ago. Um, and I think what, what we're trying to do through using that language is described by Cass Sunstein, who's a professor at Harvard Law School and wrote a book in 2019 called How Change Happens. And in it, he describes how norm change happens. And oftentimes in society, old norms that no longer serve us well are breaking down and new ones are trying to disrupt uh, that order. And I, I think we believe that's happening today. We, we thought it was happening when we changed the name to Encore, that at that point, the old idea of traditional retirement was being disrupted by longer working lives. And we wanted to use language to describe what we thought was one of the highest aspirations of many people who were working longer. And I think we feel the same things happening today. This idea of profound age segregation um, is being disrupted by the idea of generations coming to, together. Um, and so much of it is happening in ways that are not just about mutual benefit, but also about social impact. Generations coming together in ways that can benefit people of all ages. And for us, that power of, of generations coming together led us to the idea of co-generation. I think we had this phraseology in our background, uh, thanks to our friend, Eric Liu from Citizens University, who said that the great choice that we face as we move into this much more multi-generational world was between degeneration on one hand or regeneration. And we're convinced that co-generation, which we describe as older and younger people coming together to solve problems and bridge divides, uh, co-create a better future. We believe that co-generation is not only a way to avoid degeneration, generational conflict, isolation, ageism, but it's the most powerful route to regeneration. 
So we, we're hoping to ride this wave of change that's much bigger than anything Encore could ever hope to create in a way where we name it and frame it and direct it in ways where it can have the uh, greatest power for the greater good. Um, Mark, you mentioned this, but we have changed our name before. Um, this organization was originally created as Civic Ventures. And in 2012, we changed our name to Encore.org. Eunice, you were out uh, working in the field when that happened. How did that feel for you? And what do you hope that we can learn from that experience? Yeah, I think uh, thinking back on our history makes me one, realize how long I have been part of the Encore and now Co-Generate Universe. I was um, 25 when I joined this movement and I came on board to run one of our signature programs at the time, Experience Corps in the Bay Area. And uh, I remember being so excited about this possibility of mobilizing older adults, um, their potential, their time, their talent on behalf of kids in urban public schools. And like you, Duncan, I was a young person who just loved um, the, the variety and the depth of relationship that came with being in a multi-generational environment. And as an immigrant, I had grown up with my grandparents living in my home. So some of that just felt very natural. And I had uh, two years right out of college where I entered into the traditional more young person path where I was sequestered with a bunch of young people, thought I had hit the jackpot living the glorious life and then realized I, in fact, um, wasn't happy um, or as happy. And I think it's because I was missing the intergenerational component that had been such an important part of my upbringing. So when I landed at Experience Corps, it felt like I had entered into this amazing um, world that none of my peers had access to. And I was surrounded by um, 200 older adults over the course of time in the Bay Area who were part of my team, um, as well as a bunch of young volunteer coordinators who were doing a year of AmeriCorps service, helping me run the program. So it was interesting. At the time, um, what I knew of Encore um, was this innovative organization that was launching these intergenerational programs in new and exciting ways. It felt fresh. Um, the asset framing for older adults around purpose and what they still had to give um, felt right and right for the time. Um, when the Encore language started to seep in, I remember feeling a little nervous because so much of Encore's work to date had been around service and volunteerism. It was the root of their signature program. And a lot of the uh, experimentation around the word Encore was around Encore careers. Um, what was interesting was even that experimentation came in part from seeing this body that you know wasn't one or two hundreds and then thousands of older adults who wanted to make a difference in education. And naturally, some of them started to say, well, I don't want to just be a volunteer tutor. I, I want to be a paid stipended tutor. Or I maybe want to go back and get my certification and become a teacher. I want to enter and uh, the education field in a different way. Or I want to launch a startup because I want to take all my skills and launch an educational um, social impact company. So uh, we were seeing all of this, uh, this, these new things that were happening that wasn't where we had started and it opened up the eyes of there's more. And, uh, and yet we had this, as Mark said, this, we hit upon this barrier of not having robust enough language for talking about what that was. It certainly wasn't retirement and it wasn't really volunteerism. And so when that Encore language came out, I think it forced me um, I thought I had entered a field where I was doing things in a fresh way, and it pushed me to the next level of even reframing how I saw the work of what my volunteers were doing, um, that even I had put a cap on what volunteerism could be. Um, it is an incredible pathway towards a second career, a third career, a fifth career for somebody um, who's an older adult. And I should think about designing my program that way. I should think about the team building like a multi-generational workforce. But these are the things that the shift to Encore caused me to see. But at first I was like, wait, am I going to be left behind? Is Encore going to move on to something different? Um, in essence, what they did was to open up um, the tent, to bust it wide open. And we brought in such a bigger field. And I think that's why we've been able to achieve what we have in the time that we've been Encore. Um, to get to code generate, I think we're in a very similar moment. I think there are some in the Encore field that have similar questions of, wow, what does this mean for us? Um, will we feel less relevant in the coming days as Encore starts to shift its focus to code generate? Um, I think it's the same playbook. Many of you who've been here watching us, listening to us, reading our newsletters have seen this word code generate for probably at least a year. We've been testing it out there. We've been seeing if it is resonant. And I think like Encore, we've been missing a word that indicates 
older and younger working together, not just for mutual benefit, but kind of going out and impacting the world because of the unique skills and experiences they bring. Um, and as we do that, the Encore world becomes even more relevant because it, it's the place where we've amassed purpose-driven older people who want to do good in the world, second acts for the greater good. Um, what we haven't done as good a job of is to connect the older adults with um, equally robust and vibrant movements of young people who also are incredibly socially activated. And that's why this moment is perfect for us to do this. Um, I think the experience of the Encore field is going to be one in which the work is more urgent. And all of a sudden we're gonna be trying to bring up all these collaborators and partners that will make the work even more fresh and exciting. Thanks Eunice. And just as a reminder to folks, please add any questions to the chat. Um, we'll be getting to those soon. Um, but to go back to um, some of what you were talking about, you talked about the importance of programs and some of the programs um, that we've developed at Encore. You spent so much of your time um, at Encore and now co-generate uh, designing and leading new programs to help us achieve our mission. And I know you've been thinking a lot about the program portfolio that's going to bring this co-generate vision to life. So what's on tap for the future? Yeah, well, um, once again, you guys are like, you're, you're our circle. So you, you've heard us before. This is not going to sound all that different. Um, we're going to do three things, three things that we're actually um, quite good at. One is we're going to show the pattern. We're going to grow the pattern. We're going to accelerate the pattern. Um, it used to be the pattern was around showing purpose and potential for older adults. Um, right now, we're showing the pattern for older and younger, not, to, not just for older people to do things for young people, but to do them with young people, and then together to impact the world in profound and new ways. So part of showing the pattern is, um, is showing that it's, it's actually already happening out there. We are not the creators of the co-generational movement. Um, we may be the ones trying to test out this word and this new framing on it, but the work is out there, it's happening. We need to find where it's happening. Um, it's happening in a lot of immigrant cultures, indigenous cultures, in um, rural communities, uh, in faith institutions, on college campuses. Where can we start to elevate the stories where it's naturally occurring so people can pay attention to it, start to see it for themselves, um, and then we'll back it up with research and thought leadership. Some of you saw the University of Chicago uh, research we just put out by NORC that shows that pretty much everybody, old and young, says that they think co-generation is a good idea. They want to bring generations together for good. Um, at the same time, most people say they don't really know how to do it or there aren't easy pathways. Once again, that's sounding really familiar. When we launched Encore, older adults wanted to have a second act, but there weren't really good pathways. So we're, we're taking the things that we're really good at and we're pointing it in this um, kind of broader umbrella sort of way. Um, on Grow the Pattern, once again, our specialty, the things we're good at are innovation and narrative change, and not just doing them separately, but creating sort of a flywheel where one starts to influence the other and both grow. Um, you'll see us take some of the things we've been experimenting with over the last few years, like our Innovation Fellowship, the Public Voices Fellowship, um, some of the ways we've been trying to get more creative around narrative change and storytelling but you'll see us point it at a specific challenge like social isolation and loneliness or climate change or economic inequality and actually have a cohort solely focused on that topic. We think if we can actually amass um, a small number of innovators, but working together in one area, we can actually get more attention and more leverage that way. Um, so you'll see some of that. The last one is we'll accelerate the pattern. So it's really important for us to build a community of intergenerational leaders who are passionate about doing that work together. Um, and so we'll be building a collaboration of alumni of our programs, of partners that we're already working with who are really anchored in um, reciprocity and the act of mutual aid. And we're gonna try and push this momentum forward. Mark, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. Oh, and you're on mute. Sure. I, I should just um, reiterate the context for all this and why we think that this particular moment is, is so ripe. Uh, a year and a half ago, the Stanford Center on Longevity published their new map of life report. And the, one of the portions of that report was written by our former Encore Public Voices fellow, Sasha Shin Joffrey at, at Stanford. And it, um, it forever transformed my view of what the, big change in society uh, in front of us is, you know, I, 
when, when we started the Gen to Gen campaign, I, I remember the statistic in my mind was that for the first time ever, there were more people over 60 than under 18 in the United States. But what I learned from Sasha's work and from the new map of life is that we are actually the most age diverse society in human history. In, in 1900, if you look at it, chart of the age breakdown of society from zero to 74, it's a straight downhill slide um, from, from the beginning of life to, to the 70s. If you look at that exact same chart in 2020, it's a flat line. Uh, there are the same number of people who are 36 and 11 and 43 uh, and 71. And that's our future. It's this multi-generational moment now, but it's just going to continue. Right now in society, we have 25% of the population under 20, 23% over 60, and 52% in between. So our future is an age-diverse future. And at the same time, uh, what we've inherited is a, a state of age apartheid. We're the most age-segregated society in history where we channel young people into schools and other institutions with just young people, middle people into workplaces and older people into mostly uh, older people only settings like nursing homes, senior centers, retirement communities, um, spectacular innovation around that to solve problems at the moment, but they've uh, bequeathed us a kind of grievous legacy. So, um, you know, a lot of people are saying that's going to be the source of degeneration, um, but we, we think there's every bit as much an opportunity to be seized here as a problem to be avoided. And so that's that's really the, the backdrop. And the great news is that all over the world now, people are solving that, this problem and moving in, in the direction of, of cogeneration. You raised the, the NORC study. One of the things we found from the NORC study is there was great common purpose between older and younger people around a whole set of issues the environment, education that are going to be essential for a better future. And what we also discovered, which was a surprise, is um, that the leadership uh, and the call to action is coming from younger generations. The most dedicated group um, to working together with other generations as Generation Z and throughout the age span, individuals of color. And I, I the, the call to action emerging from the report from young people to us elders. I say this as somebody who will in six months get my <laughs> Medicare card is, A, you can't create all these problems and then pat us on the back and say, go solve them. But the much more constructive message that came out is and we can't do this alone and we don't want to do this alone. These issues are bigger than any generation can solve solely. And so I think that charge is there. And I think it very much leads, as you were saying in the Grow the Pattern segment, to an imperative to be as creative in bringing people together across generations um, as we've been in splitting them apart. And we're going to dedicate ourselves to making that happen. Um, you know, this is the... Uh... The birthday for Cogenerate, but as an organization, we're going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary next year. What does that mean for both of you as you look back? You can go first, Mark. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> well, there is a sense at a personal level of uh, coming full circle. When I started this organization, um, uh, 24 and multiple months, years, years ago, I did it with John Gardner, who um, was Lyndon Johnson's Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. He's the person who implemented Medicare and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. He's the person who started Common Cause, the most important campaign reform organization. He uh, created independent sector. Um, and he um, really, ever since his time at uh, health education and welfare, felt like we were missing this vast opportunity to bring the generations together. He's the person who coined the phrase, the name Experience Corps, and we worked closely together to create the organization. And then you fast forward 25 years, and uh, now I have this great opportunity uh, to work 
together with Eunice um, across some number of years, not quite as many as, as existed between John and I, which was close to 50, um, to, to launch the next chapter of the organization. So there's a sense of coming full circle in that way. And then also in, in the work, you know, I think in the beginning years, I thought of ourselves as a kid's organization in the guise of being an aging organization, because we were mobilizing older people to address many of the needs of, of young people. And now I'm um, with the benefit of of perspective, realize that we're we're a kids organization, we're an aging organization, we're an everybody in between organization, because we're addressing this new reality of of age diversity, and we're um, um, and so I I feel like we're doing it in a way that doesn't abandon our past, but in but brings everything we've learned all along the way with us. Um, I'll add to that that when I think about our 25 years, of which I think I've been part of it for something like 20, 22, 22 years of it or something like that, um, is that it's given me a chance to look back at the things I did way back then and see that the aspects of co-generation were always there. Um, you've Many of you who've been tracking Mark for years have heard him use the language um, kind of hiding in plain sight. Older adults are there hiding in plain sight. Um, co-generation is there hiding in plain sight. So. Um, I gave talks all the time when I was running Experience Corps, mobilizing older adults to want to come in and work in public schools to help kids read by third grade. I talked about it as a program of older adults helping young people. The reality of what was happening is these older adults were partnering with young national service members to deliver that service together. These older adults, these volunteers were working with teachers, often young teachers, um, who saw my volunteers as a stable um, group of people who came back year after year after year because they weren't transitional. Those young teachers started to rely on my volunteers as part of their team. Um, my volunteers had mailboxes in the uh, in the school office with their names on it as if they were just like the teachers. Um, so that aspect of multi-generational team was there from the get-go. And I would hear from the older volunteers that uh, sometimes they would talk with equal, if not more excitement about working with the young people as colleagues than they did with the kids. Um, it was it, That was the thing they were missing when they retired. Um, so there's a different world in which we could have been co-generation way back then. And then I think about another signature program of ours, Encore Fellows. Um, that's a program that brings people who are thinking about retiring or leaving their primary career, often a corporate career, and needing an on-ramp, basically an internship for grownups to transition into the social sector. Um, I was fortunate in my late 20s to host two of the very first Encore Fellows in the Experience Corps program. They helped us do a, a major change management initiative. We often talk about that program like it's a, it's a service delivery program. Get these brilliant people from the corporate sector and their skills will help you solve a problem in your workspace. What's actually happening behind the scenes, the way I experienced it was, I got these two incredibly talented people who had worked their entire careers at HP had done change management um, on a global scale. And they dropped in with my team. We were all under the age of 30. Most of us were under 25. And they worked with us for an entire year to walk us through some really challenging operational work. But what happened is we gave them a huge download on how to work in the social sector, what it means to enter with humility and an attitude of learning, um, how heart can sometimes trump the brain, um, how small community service organizations can do incredible things for a community. Um, we definitely taught them as much as they taught us and it was a partnership once again. So uh, I think this chance to look back at 25 years has been uh, a way to see that the threads have always been there um, it makes me even more excited for the future that we have ahead. And it also gives me great confidence that um, all the work that's out there can be pulled together in a way that can be greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a board member for many years, Suzanne Braun Levine, who was the founding editor of Ms. Magazine. And she would often remind us that movements don't have an agenda, they go where the action is. And the action that keeps repeating uh um repeatedly coming out through all of our work is the power of of generations coming together in this with sense and i think that what it can lead to what we we believe it will lead to is 
to start a better way to solve problems. There's a famous semi-apocryphal study from BMW where they studied three assembly lines, one just younger workers, one just older workers, and a mixed line and discovered that the mixed line far and away outperformed the age uh, graded lines. Um, we also think that this is one of the most promising ways to, to, to get to social cohesion at a time where we're so divided, where polarization and isolation are, are so prevalent. And, and I think in a human sense, and Duncan, you started by asking us about at this 25 year juncture, it's a way to recapture something so fundamental that we've lost, which is a sense of the wholeness of life. You know, how as a young person, do you learn how to grow older gracefully and purposefully if you have very little contact with older people? How as an older person, can you be generative, which we now know is the hallmark of happiness in later life when you're cut off from people who are younger than you are. So I think at a personal level, at a uh, at a an organizational level, at a societal level, this is a, a real route to renewal. I might add one more thing, um, which is when I look back at the 25 years, Mark, where you started with John Gardner, where I started with you, Duncan, you coming into this organization as um, I are kind of by far the youngest person at that time, uh, I think we each probably felt a little bit the exception to the rule, uh, doing something a little different, doing it differently than our peers. Um, sometimes nonprofits will play a, a sort of speculative game on like, well, what would it take for us to succeed so much that we would no longer be needed? Um, I think for us in our field, what would what would make us succeed is if, if every young person um, had embedded in their life and perspective of what is normal as they age, um, to be deeply involved in doing things with older people. Um, Mark, you had that with John Gardner. I had that um, both in my upbringing in my immigrant family, as well as when I landed with Experience Corps and kind of locked into this field. Um, Duncan, you've had that a little bit before this, and then certainly the career you've had since then, I don't think we can, the three of us can imagine wanting to live or work any other way. And I think it's, for me, it's definitely shifted the way I am growing older. It's it's shifting my expectation of what I can and should do uh, in my 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. Um, you know, I'm now just a few years shy of 50. I'm probably one of very few that is looking forward to that time. I have open eyes on the challenges of aging, but I also see the upside and the potential. And I and I want to get there. I want to do this work and I want to get there. So um, I think the work that we're doing on cogeneration is the answer to how we eventually don't need to do this work anymore. We bring up young people where this just becomes the norm and then we can all call it a day. Um. We're getting tons of really good questions from the audience, so I will make this the last one, um, and I'll direct this to Eunice. Uh, I think there are a lot of folks on this call who may want to get more of this cogeneration in their own lives. Um, so, what are some ways you recommend to do that? Um, there, there are many, and there's one. No, there's no one path. Um, I'll say, if you want something really concrete that we're excited about right now, one of our board members um, brought to us an opportunity to participate in a, a cool challenge. It's called Generations Over Dinner. It's a program of Modern Elder Academy, the Association for Growth and Education, and Encore um, now Cogenerate is one of the partners. The idea is basically to see how many generations you can bring together over a conversation over dinner. Um, you know, three seems doable, but can you do four? Can you do five? Can you get six? I think I read in one of their newsletters, they just got somebody to host a dinner with seven generations. That's extraordinary. Um, but the idea there is it, it can be, it can start in your home. Um, the dinner table is a great place to start to expand your circle of concern for other people. Um, the other one is we are launching a really exciting initiative to look at college campuses, um, not just as uh, educational institutions for young people, um, colleges, if they want to stay relevant, are absolutely thinking about how to engage with the communities around them, the older adults around them, um, and not in age segregated ways. And so we're on the hunt for examples of cogeneration happening through the institutional infrastructure of campuses. So um, it's an initiative we're launching called uh, Campus Cogenerate. There's a link in the chat box if you want to check out uh, the work there. And if you know something that's happening near you or on a college campus, tell us about it. We want to learn. Um, 
we also last summer produced a 13 part series in the Stanford Social Innovation Review that was all about whether or not we're ready for a multi-generational America. And we featured innovators doing work in uh, on campuses, um, in social isolation and loneliness, in national service, um, all manner of things. So I recommend you read that article and share it with others. And then lastly, help us spread the word. Um, everybody has a story, whether it be a story of ways that you've connected meaningfully with other generations or um, the ways in which a, a lack or a loss of that has been a challenge. And so um, talk about it, look for opportunities to engage right where you are, and then join us in the work. I'll add one more, Eunice. There, there's so many uh, great partner organizations out there. You mentioned a number of them. Uh, one of our favorites is Third Act, uh, created by Bill McKibben after decades working with, with young people and college students to mobilize the older generation around climate, democracy, racial justice, and doing it in a way that's uh, utterly co-generational. One of my favorite examples of their initiatives, uh, Bill, Bill has great lines. One he, he says, uh, describes Third Act as uh, fossils against fossil fuels, but he, he's got a seniors to seniors program where older people are working together uh, to help register high school seniors to vote. And I think it all harkens back to one of our role models, which is the Gray Panthers created by Maggie Kuhn, who's uh, buried in my hometown of Philadelphia under a gravestone that says, here lies Maggie Kuhn under the only stone she left unturned. And the mantra of the Gray Panthers was young and old in action together. It was relevant in 1971. It couldn't be more uh, timely today. All right, uh, Marcy. I know you were having some tech trouble. Are you are you there? Yep. Excellent. Um, yeah. Why don't I spotlight you? And I'm going to turn it over to you to direct the Q&A. Thank you so much to everyone who's been putting questions in chat. Well, we have so many questions. And um, I thought I would start with the questions that many people were asking. So there is one that we anticipated, and it came from several people who asked it in different ways, which is obviously we've spent all of this time building up the Encore movement, movement, normalizing the idea of Encore careers, making it easier, we hope, for people to find and um, have Encore careers with social impact. How do you both see that work now um, fitting into the co-generate uh, movement? Feel free to, whichever one of you wants to start. Eunice, why don't you? Start? Yeah, um, I feel like I um, I talked about that a little bit before, but I'll just say again, I feel like the Encore movement is critical for the co-generate um, work. Uh, you, we don't get co-generation without a, a vibrant and robust vision for the Encore space. Um, that is a nest. It's just like that's a piece that we've spent a lot of time building. Um, and trying to stand that up in a way that has a life of its own. When we've said, um, show the pattern, grow the pattern, accelerate the program, we hope that after 25 years, the Encore movement feels like it's in the acceleration piece. Um, that, and then that's not to say there isn't so much more investment that needs to happen, but part of that, our, our confidence to say, we don't need to drive that solely is because many of you on the call are doing that work. Um, the Encore network, which used to be run and housed within Encore, now is running independently. Um, and is generating some incredible, uh, incredible content and incredible partners. We love actually being a partner of the Encore Network rather than running it. And we hope that the Encore Network considers us one of their biggest champions. Um, we'd love to do that for anybody in the Encore space. At the same time, the body of work that's undeveloped is connecting the Encore space with all of the movement building that's happening with young people. And like Mark said, we can't afford to be doing this work in silos. Our challenges today are too great. Um, and it, it doesn't help when we're doing it separately. And then you add on top of that toxic polarization, um, uh, the challenges around climate that Mark talked about, social isolation, loneliness, and the pandemic. These are not problems that can be solved generationally alone, not just alone, but specifically without the generations working together. And the generations have different assets. And so uh, this is the perfect time for us to not um, to not leave the Encore sector, but to say, let us be a bridge. Let us create a bridge. Let us build partnerships with young people. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I'm in 
what we might describe as like a traditional encore space. And what I hear is everybody wants to work with young people, but they don't know how to access them. We're in a learning mode there. Let us be part of that learning on how to do that and bring that here. But we also can't do it alone. So we are going to want to help uh, expand your ability to connect and do that with us. Yeah, you know, I... I I was yep. going to ask you a different question, Mark, because there are many questions. And so I'm going to ask that each one of you just chime in on one, if that's OK. So let's, Mark, I want to ask you this question. Um, obviously, you and Eunice are adopting this co-generational, co-leadership model. Um, people have been asking us, how in other ways are we helping our organization, our board, our movement be more age diverse, kind of embody what co-generation is all about? Yeah, we, we, um, we are trying to um, build a movement that reflects everything we've been talking about uh, in kind of abstract terms. And I, when I think of it, I think of, uh, of the great work Chip Connolly's done in creating the modern elder movement. And in a way, that's how we thought about our work as the, the older generation being the cavalry coming over the hill, which is a great phrase from Laura Carstensen, a longtime board member at the, at the organization. But we're, we realize that um, we need to not only come over the hill as modern elders, but we need to do it jointly with young people who were like Eunice was when she was in her 20s, I feel like I, like I was, like so many of the Encore movement members were, um, they're kinds of old souls. <laughs> they're young people who have kind of curiosity and wisdom um, and who want to come together with older people who share those same uh, traits. And I think partly we want to do that because, you know, we can't do it alone. But I, I think underneath it all, and you hinted at this, Eunice, is because it's a great source of joy. You know, I mean, that the Harvard study of adult development found that older people who worked in that way with younger people were three times as likely to be happy as those who failed to do so. You know, it's a best-selling book, 10% happier, or maybe this is 300% happier. So I think this is a movement of uh, effective action and, um, and abiding joy. Eunice, this is a question I know you're going to love, which is um, how might we be ready to help other people who want to learn how to co-generate once we learn more about how to co-generate? <laughs> how are we thinking about that? Yeah, I think of, I think that Encore now co-generate has always had a lens towards learning. I don't think you can be in the innovation space without having as your highest bar learning. Um, and part of learning to be very clear and transparent is failing. Um, we cannot learn and innovate without failure. And then how do we learn from that, move on and do other things. And so um, the reason we have our innovation fellowships is not because we think 15 people is all we should invest in um, or our generation serving together grantees. We have eight. Oh my goodness, I wish we could have 800. But it's because we need to keep that at a scope where we can learn and be in conversation with people. Um, so what we what you'll see us do though is as soon as we're able to actually help those um, the fellows the partners we can invest in um, to put them on a on, on a platform virtual has made it easier to share our learnings to share them not when it's all done and in some report that frankly nobody reads and puts on a shelf but to do it conversationally um, and to do it in ways where we can ask we can both show you what some people are being thoughtful to learn about but then put you in conversation with them and with each other. Uh, you'll see that we've been experimenting. If you've been coming to some of our virtual summits and our showcases, thank you for going on that journey with us. We've been trying to build in aspects of mutual aid. We've been asking you to come with your ideas and you know, we might have 600 people on a call and we'll ask you to try it out in a small group. Sometimes those things work. Sometimes the format isn't quite right. But I hope what you see is we're trying to spread the learning. Um, and then we're doing things like that research, the University of Chicago research. We're building case studies. You see us telling stories. We hope that those are things that will also help um, with the learning aspect. The community building piece is one. Um, the final thing I'll say here is I think we've often focused on program and the intentional community building has not been something we've been funded to do. So if there are funders on the call, one thing I'll say is you have to fund the community. We can't build movements without 
investing in not just individual innovators and thought leaders and practitioners, but the coming together, um, it's where the strength is at. So we will, where we can, be building more intentional communities where are the alumni of our programs as the anchor who have learned in the way that we're trying to learn together can be sort of set the standard for how we want to be as a community and then increasingly invite others into that um, and connect that with other learning communities. There are so many. So um, more on that to come. Great. I have one more question for each one of you. Um, and there might there might be more if depending on how much time we have. Mark, you're going to like this question um, and really speaks to the research, which is what evidence are we seeing that younger generations actually want to co-generate with older generations? Um, and do you feel that it's being equally driven by all generations? <laughs> I, I do it, you know, just to reiterate the most recent study uh, that we've been talking about, we, we asked uh, young people and older people whether they wanted to do this, what issues they wanted to work on, um, um, what um, were the obstacles standing in the way. And, you know, as I said earlier, one of the real surprises is far and away that the group most interested in doing this were young people. Um, and I think I think the interest among older people is just as great, but I think so many of us don't feel like we're wanted. That that the younger generation is receptive, but that, that at least the University of Chicago research said that there is essentially a call to action to us, older people, to to join um, and bridge the the age divide. But the two issues that came up over and over again is one. Um, we face so much age segregation, it's not easy. You need, almost need to be an entrepreneur uh, in a do-it-yourself way to make this happen. And second, we're out of practice. Uh, we don't even know how to talk to each other because there's there's so few opportunities. And it all gets to the three things that I, the three problems that I think we need to solve together as, as a movement. Uh, one is a, a failure of imagination. Things have been divided by age for so long. We don't know how to talk to each other. We don't know how to think about um, what a co-generating the 21st century would actually look like. The second is a, a failure of innovation. It's just way too hard to come together in this way to the question that was asked previously. And then there's a, a, a challenge around impetus and organization. There are too few organizations. We have some great partners, Generations United being one of them who are working on these issues, but we need a robust movement to scale this in a way that's commensurate with the need and, and the opportunity. I'll just add to that, um, that I think we also are going to need to learn to co-generate, to collaborate across generations in some new ways. Um, once again, intergenerational collaboration isn't, isn't exactly new. Like we've, many generations have done that before us. But I do think there's something unique about working with Gen Z and, um, and our youngest generations today. And I do think there's been a revolution in kind of the democratization of leadership, of ideas, the, um, the importance uh, and prominence of lived experience. And that means part of coming into these spaces is going to need to be a dramatic humility from older generations, um, an acknowledgement of great learning uh, and, and vice versa for sure. But I think that is, that is the hallmark of what collaboration is going to look like today. And I think we're all going to need to flex. I think it's one of the reasons that Mark and I are so excited about leading this shift to co-generation as a co-generationally um, informed leadership team. And uh, on, on one hand, Mark and I could not be more different. Um, our background racially, uh, age-wise, you know, I'm coming from an immigrant family. Uh, we see things sometimes a little bit differently. And at the same time, we have a foundational um, set of shared values around the importance of cross-generational collaboration. Um, we value older people so much. We value young people so much. That is a common bond that I think can get us through um, many differences. And we think that is true for others. Uh, there's uh, one of our, um, one of the people we, we both greatly admire, John A. Powell at the Othering and Belonging Institute at Berkeley talks about um, generational bridging as the short bridge. Uh, there are many long bridges we must travel that are important to do on race, ec um, economics, other things. 
the generational one is the, is in some ways even the false bridge. We are all young. We're all getting older each day. It's the one thing that we can't really other, and yet we do all the time. Um, so if we think of that as like the doable one, the doable thing that we can actually work on, um, that's what makes this, even this question of do older and younger want to work together? Uh, the answer is yes. It's just about how do you build that bridge? How do we get people together? How do we get over ageism? Um, it, it, it's absolutely doable. We are each other. We're this, we, are, we are part of the same line. And, and the truth is, you know, to just uh, underscore everything you're saying, the aberration is that we haven't been doing it over the, the recent decades, uh, maybe over the last century. Working across generations, working co-generationally is the grain of human history. I mean, human beings began because of the role grandparents played in raising infants uh the grandmother hypothesis is is you know the 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 absolute foundation of everything <laughs> that we came from and it's true that through most of human history um this is the way we lived and now as you point out the challenge is, is how do we marry the grandmother hypothesis with the modern family world with our multi racial multicultural future and with uh, the multi-generational world and and i think um that's already happening uh all over the globe and we need to to learn from that and build on it yeah and i think the piece that we can all focus on is there's like a person there's an aspect to this work that's deeply personal that's why you hear us kind of ping pong back and forth between what you can do over your dinner table, how you can reach out to a, a neighbor, maybe that is older or younger that you've just never interacted with before. There are some pieces that are just about opening your eyes and being willing to be proximate and extend yourself beyond um, what you naturally would do in your daily life. Um, but it's equally the work that Encore is doing more broadly is because of the, um, the missing kind of institutional pieces that are connecting um, people who want to collaborate with the ability to do so. Um, that's that innovation and narrative change flywheel that I talked about before. We, we want to invest in those who are experimenting, aggressively experimenting with how we can do this either differently or to take the things that are working and do more of it so that the next time somebody says, I really wanna work with somebody older or younger than me, they look around and there's an opportunity right there. Um. You know, so we have one question sitting here that is just something you talk about all the time. So I'm just um, dying to send it to you, which is how do we learn from other cultures, for example, indigenous, immigrant, et cetera, about how to co-generate and how do we teach this to groups of older and younger people? I'm thinking about this in the context of higher ed, particularly in experiential education where students work with organizations, nonprofits, co-op teams, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I think that's so, it's so important. And um, sometimes, especially when we work in the field of innovation, it feels like everything needs to be newfangled um, and created from scratch. The reality is this work in particular needs to be built on what's already working um, and what is still present in immigrant and in indigenous communities, um, black communities, uh, Latin American communities. There's so much that's already there, but I also want to be clear. Um, I grew up in, in, intergenerational and immigrant family. It's not all, um, you know, rainbows, right? Like there's also, I was, I was born here. I was raised here. There's a language difference between myself and my grandparents. Um, there were cultural differences and a desire to, to distinguish and differentiate. So there's actually a bit of, um, a burden and baggage there too. And we've had many innovation fellows who are working specifically within a cultural frame, the Vietnamese community, the Korean community, um, and other immigrant communities on how to bridge those differences. So I think we just, once again, we have to be in a learning stance. Uh, one thing that I think about because Mark and I speak in many different uh, forums is there are some here in our community that have um, kind of positional control over who gets to speak who gets to tell the story, um, even what language the stories are told in. One of our innovation fellows um, does a storytelling project where um, the stories of the older immigrants are told in their own language. And I think how often, even for my grandparents, their story had to be translated multiple times until some um, version of it was told in English. How do we actually elevate even the speaking of that language? Um, I think we just have to be more open to it uh, to, as the dominant culture to say, how can we invite that into the space and how can we go learn in that space? Is it always having them come over here? Can we build something that that is just 
all of us together. Mm, Mark, I see you nodding. And I'm actually going to ask you if you want the final word here, because I'd love to hear what that's raising for you. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I want the final word, but I, I was inspired by what Eunice said. And it made me think of something else, too, which is, is to avoid the tendency to romanticize this as all sweetness and light. Eunice used the word rainbows. And, and I think we need a new narrative, but a new narrative that's credible. And I think we're seeing it playing out in front of us. My I talk a lot about hacks, the Emmy award-winning TV show this year. And partly it's, I guess, during the pandemic, I watched too much TV. But the New York Times described hacks as a love story disguised as a hate story. And I think that the the narrative in Hacks and so many other shows which end up with the generations coming together starts out with antipathy, reluctantly coming together, um, being forced to face a challenge, um, and in the process of that, discovering that that older and younger people can do things together that they could never do on their own. And then that leads to the ultimate prize, which is affection, connection, the, the love story. And I'd love to see a case of uh, life imitating art in our future where this supposed um, degeneration that we hear about so much turns out to be a, a love story um, and one between all generations um, that creates a more cohesive society. Mm. Thanks, Eunice, because I know you riff off each other. Did that give you anything you want to kind of close with? Um, you know, just to just to say that I think the core of, of what we do, frankly, what I think Encore has always done is to create a platform for something as ambitious as love. And anybody who has worked um, in a space where they're trying to create belonging, um, connection, uh, a place, a place where you feel like you can see yourself knows that that's not soft. It's not fuzzy. It's really hard work. Um, in order to belong, in order to actually demonstrate and show love, you have to be willing to dig in and 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 be who you are. Be willing to change, learn, and grow. Um, I think that's 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 the work. So I agree with Mark. Um, we never want our work to feel. Um, uh, to feel soft because it's not. And once again, so many of you here in this room with us are doing that work and you know it. The, the benefit on the other side is Mark and I, I'll say just from our co-leadership, we talk all the time like, man, I sometimes I'm like, man, I somehow my work now, I feel like I'm doing two times more work. But I will say there is also a lot more joy, even going into whether it be a funder meeting or into a speaking situation or developing strategy, doing it with somebody. Uh, it's just so much, it's so much better. Mark, would you get so much better? Mm -hmm. um, so. Absolutely. It's about the intersection of efficiency and humanity. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, we promised you we'd get you out of here in under an hour. And um, obviously we could all just go on and engage with this for our quite a long time. And we do engage with this frequently. So we host monthly webinars on co-generational topics. We hope to see more of you at those webinars. Um, we hope you'll start spreading the word about our new mission and invite others to get involved. And we hope you will find ways to co-generate with us. We wanna hear from you. We are here to work with you. We are interested in all the co's that are part of co-generate and collaboration is the biggest one to us. So. We never want this to feel um, like a one-way experience. We want to find ways to work with as many of you as possible. And thanks for taking the time to join us today.